First off, I'd like to thank the library uh, for organizing this event. I think we're in a time of change right now in the Northwest Territories, uh, in part with, uh, with devolution. Uh, we've gained responsibility over managing environment and land. Uh, and uh, there are, are other changes that are occurring as well, and some of those I'm going to address in my talk. I think it's critical that we move forward and make decisions on the best available information. The venue here can provide opportunities for knowledge generators, policymakers, um, practitioners, and politicians to learn from one another and to share perspectives. So I think it's, it's potentially a great venue that I hope continues to grow. And uh, now that I've raised everyone's expectations of what this is all about, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you in the next half hour. The bulk of my talk is going to focus on science and how we use science to understand the environment around us. Uh, as a scientist, I practice science. At its most basic level, uh, science is a systematic method of inquiry that allows us to explore the world around us. It's cumulative. It allows us to collect and organize knowledge. So in the next half hour, I'm going to focus on climate warming and permafrost and the relationships between the two. We can think of permafrost as the geological manifestation of climate. Uh, so the two are inextricably linked. And we're finding that feedbacks with permafrost warming may in fact influence climate as well. Human disturbance and warming of permafrost is another topic that we'll cover. And then finally, large landscape scale changes that are occurring in parts of the NWT. So some of the common themes that I want to bring out in today's talk is focusing on the fact that change is happening. Uh, it's not theory, it's, it's happening right before our eyes and it's changing the context within which we live. Uh, secondly, I want to bring out ideas that support the culture of knowledge generation. I think that's a really important thing to have in the territories, particularly in, in, our, in our government. And also the importance of multidisciplinary approaches. Most of the challenges that, we're, that we face and that we're going to face into the future are complicated and they require perspectives um, from different uh, fields of science but also from different, uh, different perspectives altogether including things like traditional knowledge. I think that's an underlying theme that, that I hope to, to bring out in the talk and then of course linking some of these scientific findings to uh, decisions that can be made by uh, policymakers and also uh, planners. So it's a bit of a bias here, but of course, I've said this before, probably the most important thing in the, in the north is permafrost. It, it uh, defines high latitudes. It's the glue that holds the land together. Permafrost is defined as ground that stays frozen. Um, it's something that you can't see. However, it manifests itself in ways that make it very evident whether it is there or not. And it has a huge, uh, huge impact on, on, like I said, everything around us in the north. Uh, permafrost can be described by its spatial extent. So in the north, uh, uh, the north of the NWT where it's particularly cold, permafrost underlays the entire landscape and it's, it's simply earth materials that remain below zero uh, throughout, throughout the year. As you move further south, the proportion of the landscape that's underlain by permafrost decreases. The thickness of permafrost also decreases as you move southward. So around Yellowknife, permafrost is, is discontinuous and it may be anywhere from several meters to tens of meters in thickness. But as we get further north in the continuous permafrost, frozen ground persists uh, to hundreds of meters th in thickness. A layer of soil that thaws and refreezes every year at the ground surface is called the active layer. And the active layer is defined uh, or dictated by the, th the, by the, the properties of the soil uh, as well as vegetation cover and so forth. So if we remove the vegetation cover, there's the potential that the active layer will deepen. If the active layer, sorry, if the active layer thickens and the top of permafrost has lots of ice in it, the ground will subside and you, you have, you have uh, terrain, uh, changes in the terrain. Now permafrost is also characterized by the temperature. So you could have very warm permafrost or you could have permafrost that's many degrees below zero. And part of that relationship is defined by temperature, but there are other factors that influence the exchange of energy between the atmosphere and the Earth's surface and the ground surface, and that includes vegetation and includes snow cover. So a lot of my colleagues in the, at the geoscience office um, 
have generally, from a scientific perspective, very little interest in vegetation, but as a permafrost scientist, vegetation is fundamental to understanding the physical characteristics of, of permafrost. So I have an interest in it. Uh, permafrost derives its geotechnical significance from the presence or absence of ice in the ground. So it's defined as a temperature phenomenon, but if you could have permafrost in the bedrock around Yellowknife, and if the permafrost thaws, comes above zero, there's going to be absolutely no impact on the ground surface. However, if the permafrost contains lots of ice in it, then the, the consequences can be substantial. So as a, as a permafrost scientist, uh, as a planner, it's important to understand the, the distribution of the ice in permafrost as well as the nature of that ice. I'm going to briefly talk about climate warming and permafrost, um, not focus so much on, on warming air temperatures per se, other than to say that the climate is warming based on the instrumented record. We know that the climate is warming quite relatively rapidly in the north, particularly in the Northwest Territories. And global climate models, they vary in terms of the predictions of the magnitude of change into the future, but ultimately all of them are predicting that we can expect continued warming uh, well into the, uh, well, throughout the next century. So as a permafrost scientist, we're interested in knowing whether or not the changes in air temperature that have occurred over the last 30 to 50 to 100 years have in influenced permafrost temperatures. And we're fortunate in, in the Western Arctic in particular, uh, there was a researcher by the name of Dr. Mackay. Uh, Ross Mackay is, um, started working in the Mackenzie Delta in the 50s, and he's kind of like the, the Wayne Gretzky of, of permafrost research. Ross uh, was very meticulous in his data collection, and when the oil and gas companies were working in the Mackenzie Delta region in the 70s, he followed them around and measured ground temperatures in shot holes and put together a very comprehensive data set of ground temperatures, which we were able to revisit at present day and determine that in fact, yes, the permafrost temperatures have warmed uh, by several degrees in the Mackenzie Delta region, which isn't surprising, but, but we're actually able to document that. Now, another influence or effect that, that warming, particularly in the Western Arctic, has had is on the vegetation. And the vegetation, in particular, uh, tall shrubs, Observations of local community uh, and land users have suggested that the tundra has become much shrubbier. This image here that you see, the map, uh, is a composite of Landsat image, images, and Landsat is a satellite that takes pictures of the, uh, of the Earth um, on a regular basis. Now, what that image there is a composite, it's a composite of the relative change in the greenness or greenness index uh, since the 80s. And what it shows is that the Western Arctic, the Mackenzie Delta region, particularly the Tuck Coastlands, have greened uh, extensively uh, since the 80s. And when we look at this at a global scale, it's one of the areas that's greened the most uh, in the last uh, 30 years. Now, the reason that I'm interested in that is because of the influence that vegetation has on snow cover. Now, when we look at the differences in the ground temperatures between Inuvik and Tuck, uh, tuk 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 being on the tundra, and Inuvik is in the, in the boreal forest. The air temperatures between those two locations, which are about 80 kilometers apart, the average air temperature is only about a, a degree different. But the permafrost in Tuk is about seven or six degrees cooler than it is in Inuvik. And that difference is due to the fact that in the tundra, in the winter, the snow is very hard packed, in contrast to the subarctic boreal where you have a thick, uh, thick snow cover and it, it acts as a very good insulator. So in the winter time, when the air temperatures drop, heat can be extracted from the ground very, very easily where there's a low snow cover and that results in more cooling of the ground and that's why the, the permafrost is much colder uh, further north uh, on the tundra. Now, if the tundra is starting to green and that affects snow cover, then that might change. It might compound the effects of, of warming air temperatures alone. When we look at the greening map, uh, this is just a zoom on the greening map, and we can see that some areas have greened more than other areas. And the little red dots you see that I've put on that map are old uh, hydrocarbon drill leases and drilling mud sumps that were constructed in the 1970s. And what, when we start analyzing the data, what the data reveals is any place that humans have put their fingerprint on the tundra in the Western Arctic, we've had a proliferation of shrubs. And so this, in, back in the days when the, when the regulators were, um, were 
building the sumps, uh, or the, the industry was building the sumps, they would dispose of drilling wastes, and they would cap the sump with a, with a sump cover, and the idea was that the materials would remain frozen in permafrost, and an active layer would be maintained in the sump cover. That revegetation of the sumps was actually viewed as quite a positive thing, um, because they became more, um, or less conspicuous. However, uh, what we're finding is that the proliferation of tall shrubs on these sumps results in, in the trapping of snow. So regardless of how much snow falls on the tundra, it's a windy place in the wintertime, all the snow blows off the tundra and just sticks to these old, old leases. And the ground temperatures on the leases are several degrees warmer than they are in the adjacent tundra. And this actually caused uh, some concerns to the, the proponents of the Mackenzie Gas Project uh, when they were looking at engineering um, uh, the anchor field facilities because the permafrost at their old leases was several degrees warmer than what knowledge of the regional conditions um, told them it should be. So we have this scenario where we have stability of, 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 uh, of, of one of these sumps. Then we have the proliferation of shrubs. One of the reasons that shrubs tend to grow very quickly in these locations is that the sumps are comprised of excavated, or they're capped with excavated permafrost materials, which are very nutrient-rich soils. Um, so the, the shrubs really seem to like that type of uh, condition. And uh, eventually snow collects and the permafrost thaws. So we exp uh, approached one of, the, uh, one of the companies and asked if we could clear the shrubs from their lease and they once we explained the rationale behind this, they, they were okay with it, and we cut the shrubs off of the, uh, off of the sump. And the black line there in the, uh, is, it, it, on the graph is a temperature profile of the coldest ground temperatures in the sump down to three meters depth at the end of winter. And it shows that at the ground surface, uh, the permafrost or the ground uh, temperatures get to about minus two, and there's, the, the ground temperatures at depth are barely frozen. Once we removed the shrubs, the snow didn't accumulate and the ground almost immediately cooled off several degrees. So the, uh, the notion that there is a potentially a management option um, to, uh, to keep the ground cold, at least in the short term, is, is a possibility. And I think some of these concepts can be extended to other types of linear infrastructure, in particular, uh, in particular roads. And this is a, a photograph that uh, is taken by a, a colleague of mine who's an ecologist. And the, what never jumped out to me as a permafrost scientist or some of my engineering colleagues who've traveled the road with me was the fact that there's a swath of green alder that have proliferated adjacent to the road. Uh, once we instrumented um, this, these areas, we found that the areas within the alders had ground temperatures that were several degrees warmer than the adjacent tundra or the roadbed. So there's, there's been this, um, this feedback, we believe, between uh, road dust uh, that's deposited on the, uh, on the tundra. It tends to increase the pH of the soils um, in addition to potentially the inhibition of drainage because of the, uh, of the road corridor. The shrubs have proliferated. They've, they trap snow. They warm the permafrost, the ground settles, more moisture collects, and you have a positive feedback going, that, that, that basically gets put into place that ultimately could have a, a significant role in, in destabilizing the embankments of the road. So it's, it's something that I think we really need to think about in terms of the longer term management of, of, of infrastructure in tundra environments. So some take home messages from this part of the talk is the permafrost warming, uh, permafrost is warming in response to climate. There's empirical data to show that, and it, it's, it's gonna affect us at time scales that matter to, to uh, managing our infrastructure and thinking about different environmental phenomena. In the tundra, snow ecological feedbacks can accelerate the warming of permafrost. Uh, and that's in relation to this uh, effect that uh, shrubs can have on snow. And I think just from this last example, the notion of bringing together people from different disciplines within science and uh, road managers and, and, and so forth really kind of enhances or broadens the perspective on different problems that can lead to novel solutions. And I think at this point, research and experimentation is, is, is really important to help guide best practices. So from what I've said, one might say, well, why don't we just cut all the shrubs down and we'll keep the permafrost cool. I mean, there could conceivably very, be very, there could be um, 
in, um, results or um, uh, occurrences that would happen because of that that we just that are unforeseen. So, you know, an experimental approach I think is is the way to move forward on this. The next topic I want to touch on, that's the, the second and the last one in the talk, is large scale landscape change. And so this deals more with um, with environmental changes that are occurring in areas of ice-rich permafrost. And it summarizes some work that we've done in the Peel Plateau in response to community concerns and observations of large-scale changes. And the quote here uh, from Robert Alexi Sr. in Fort McPherson is the hills are getting really messy. And Robert is, a, is an elder in Fort McPherson and he's spent a lot of time in the land and he's, he's actually very engaged in um, different uh, renewable resource boards and so forth. And, his perception of these changes, which from a technical perspective, a permafrost scientist would call that a retrogressive thaw slump, uh, Robert's summary is probably a lot more effective to the layperson. Uh, and we've seen these big changes and um, the work uh, or the presentation that uh, I'm going to proceed with is, is a summary of that work. We can see that these uh, disturbances are, are, are massive in size and potentially will threaten infrastructure in the future if they aren't already. So a slump essentially forms when ground ice and permafrost is exposed. And you can see here of, of at the top, a stream has eroded uh, uh, into a, a side of a hill. It's exposed ground ice. And as that ground ice is exposed to solar inputs, it chews its way up slope. And it does so on the order of 5 to 10 to 20 meters a year. So unlike a landslide, which occurs almost instantly, thaw slumps, they grow over time. Um, and they have potentially a very, very long life. Some of them can remain active for several decades. Eventually, materials will accumulate and insulate the exposed ice, and the slump will stabilize, it'll revegetate, and the, 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 the train surface is, is stable. And, and if you have a keen eye for geomorphology, you can fly over or look at the landscape, and you can probably pick out old features on the landscape. But something's changing. We're, we're starting to see thaw slumps that are orders of magnitude bigger than the scars of old slumps and anything that, that we've, we've seen in, in the recent past. So this is, this is an exposure of about 100 feet of, of ground ice in a slump uh, close to the Dempster Highway. And the banded layers here are almost pure ice. So they, if you were to thaw that ice, it would consist of about 90% water and about 10% sediment. Another characteristic of these thaw slumps is the immense debris flows that they produce. So that debris flow that has infilled the entire stream valley, and we estimated that it is input approximately a million cubic meters of sediment into that valley over the last five years. And just to put that into perspective, and I could stand to be corrected here, but to build the Inuvik Tuck Highway estimated about five million cubic meters to build a strip of road from Inuvik all the way to Tuck. So it's a huge amount of, of, of geomorphic change that's occurring. And I actually superimposed that on top of downtown Yellowknife to also give you another perspective on how big some of these things are. And there are many of them. There's not one, there's hundreds of them. Uh, and they weren't there in the 1950s. So over time, these disturbances grow and they continue to impact the stream systems uh, down, downstream. We were also able to use Landsat imagery to capture and to sort of uh, to, to provide images of how the landscape has, has changed. And this is just a snapshot of one area uh, and you can see the features that exist in 2011 that were absent in 1985 and for scale there's a kilometer marker over there so they're they're all large disturbances we mapped about 5,000 square kilometers of this region and we found that the number of these disturbances has doubled and their average area has quadrupled since that time period so there, there's there's a lot going on in this part of in this part of the world and as a geomorphologist it's it's really really kind of exciting stuff to help us understand what mechanisms were in place, why are these things getting bigger? Intuitively, one would say, well, it's just because the climate's warming and the air temperatures are warmer. Um, what we decided to do is we put in trail cameras uh, at the suggestion of uh, one of the fellows, uh, Stephen Titlici, who works with us from Fort McPherson, and we uh, put together time-lapse images of what's happening in these slumps. And here you can see the head wall of the slump as it ablates over time, the top, uh, materials fall in over time and so that slump just chews its way back now those materials that are flowing down slope those big chunks you see some of those are pickup truck size and 
when the image darkens, that's, that represents one day of, of activity. So we just have this conveyor belt of materials that are being moved not very rapidly. I mean, they look rapid now because we sped everything up, but it's just this constant conveyor belt of you know, thousands and thousands of cubic meters of sediment going from slopes down into, into the valleys below. And what we were able to determine from this is we turned this time series into a quantitative data set, and we found that it is rainfall events that really accelerate the movement of these materials away from the slump headwall. And this is actually a very important point because when we look at the rainfall record, it's rainfall intensity that's changed dramatically in the, in the Western Arctic, particularly in the Peel Plateau region. If we look at rainfall records going back to the early 1900s, we find that uh, seven of the top 10 rainfall years have occurred since 1995. And when we look at the amount of rain that falls in a given day, when we look at the entire record, 25 millimeters is kind of the threshold. You, you can get some, that's, that's a lot of rain in a day, and we'd, I think all would appreciate that amount of rain here today. Um, in the Peel Plateau, that's commonplace. In 2007, we had an event that was 37 millimeters. And then in 2010, we had two events that were 67 millimeters. And then in 2012, we had a 90 millimeter event. So 90 millimeters of rain in six hours. And so these are, it's in science, we would say that's almost a different regime that's now characterizing that, that environment. Um, and what that rain does essentially is it saturates materials in the slump. And instead of them accumulating, they're rapidly removed downslope and the slump essentially stays youthful. It, the headwall con continues to be exposed and it can continue to chew its way up slope. And of course, with the removal of materials, you grow these great big debris flows. So under cold and dry conditions, and we think even under warm and dry conditions, these types of landscape features probably wouldn't proliferate. But it's under wet conditions, and particularly warm and wet conditions, that um, this landscape is going is to, we're going to see huge changes in it. Um, a lot of the folks in the communities and folks with DFO were particularly concerned in how these affect the water quality and, the, uh, and fisheries. Um, so we, we mapped the watersheds uh, that are impacted and found that a lot, of, um, that they're, they're, a lot of watersheds are significantly impacted. And we looked at the water quality effects and not surprisingly, they're very dramatic. Um, these streams in this part of the world tend to be clear water streams with low sediment loads, but these disturbances pump huge amounts of sediment into them. And when we monitor the streams downstream of these disturbances, we actually find that they're behaving like glacialized basins. So daily, the sediment loads go up and then down and up and down by up to an order of magnitude. So it's kind of a, like, we just, it's, nobody's ever described that. Uh, the, uh, streams behaving that way in non-glacial, glacialized, glacierized areas. Um, the chemistry also of permafrost is very different than that of the surface soils. The surface soils have been leached for hundreds or thousands of years in this part of the world. The permafrost essentially it consists of unweathered soil. So when those thaw, the, sol the, the amount of soluble materials in the water increases uh, 10 to 100 fold. Um, and what we're seeing also is in the chemistry of the Peel River, if we, if we look at the data that goes back to the 1960s, and we look at the main dissolved materials in the Peel River and the main dissolved materials that are contained in, in permafrost, sulfate is a good indicator of that, uh, we see that there's been a significant increasing trend over that period of record, uh, statistically, even if we use a conservative statistical method. Um, so to have a system as large as the Peel River, which drains about 70,000 square kilometers, to see it responding in that way gives you a sense that something, something big is happening. Uh, again, going back to the community's concerns and that of those of DFO, we wanted to look at how these phenomena, how this phenomena affected stream health. And so as a permafrost scientist, we can provide the context by which the biologist can step in and go, okay, we're gonna set up a study design to test the effects of these disturbances on, on organisms that live in, in, in the streams. And I mean, I could probably get myself into trouble here as a permafrost scientist talking about bugs, benthic organisms or bugs in streams, but um, essentially uh, it wasn't really 
even that surprising of a, of a finding, um, but the abundance of the benthic invertebrates, which is what they use as an indicator of stream health, uh, were the abundance was an order of magnitude less in impacted streams. So um, these clear water streams are very rich in, in these little organisms that fish eat and so forth, and they're essentially, um, um, the, the impacted streams are essentially devoid of these, uh, of these bugs. The other thing that we're, we're starting to kind of come to terms with is this, this is a legitimate emerging geohazard that has some risk to people. Um, and these large disturbances are actually, they're quite dangerous. Um, permafrost scientists have been, and geologists kind of gravitate towards any place where you have an exposure. And so where you can look at a stratigraphy. And in small slumps, permafrost scientists have always kind of walked up to the headwalls of these disturbances, which might be as, you know, 10 feet high or, you know, 15 feet high, and, and mucked around in these, in these areas. And you'd sometimes lose a boot, but that was about it. Um, our first summer uh, working in this area, we were traversing one of these debris flows, but it was, it was hard. It had dried out. And we found a moose carcass that had sunk up to here, and the moose had died. It basically, it got bogged down in the mud flow and then was, was scavenged. And it actually, for the first time, helped me understand where, you know, where the folks over at the museum find these bison encased in permafrost, and I'm thinking, how the heck does an animal get encased in permafrost? Well, it can happen, and it's these types of changes and these types of geomorphic phenomena under which this happens. Marsha Brannigan, who's a, bio, a regional biologist, or the, she's a biologist in, Inu, in Inuvik, has found, or she hasn't found, but she's been taken to two slumps when she's trying to track her radio collared bears. Um, she's not found the bear nor the collar. Um, and uh, we actually had a student that got stuck in one of these disturbances um, when he went to a place he wasn't supposed to go and the student got out, but it was not a good situation. Um, this particular disturbance here in this figure uh, is actually eating its way up and it's going to drain a lake. And this lake is about 300 meters up on the Peel Plateau, and it eventually will drain down this valley. Uh, at the end of the valley, there's a, tr there's a, a traveler's cabin that uh, the Tetlet RRC maintains. So there's phenomena like this that, that, that are going to become more commonplace, and, and people have to be aware um, of them. So I've given you a really ex uh, 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 some examples of a really extreme landscape changes, but it does beg the question, what environments are actually impacted by this? I mean. Scientists sometimes tend to go to places, study things in really interesting, you know, really interesting phenomena, but the only place you're ever going to run into something like that is if you go to, you know, the Peel Plateau at this particular coordinate. Well, what we were able to do is we were able to work with uh, people from several government departments within the GNWT as well as the University of Victoria, and we used the, uh, the spatial data warehouse um, that geomatics folks have set up and there's an online viewer that has mosaic spot imagery. And spot imagery is a, it's a satellite image. It has 10 meter resolution of pixels. And it's, it's consistent quality over all of the north of Canada. And it's stitched together and you can g play around on it just like you would on Google Earth. And so we superimposed a grid system on top of that. And we taught the different mappers. Many of them were, were summer students that were, were working up here. Uh, how to classify grid cells, and they would identify whether or not they could find disturbances, like the ones we're talking about on a grid cell, what type of environments they impacted, streams, lakes, coastal zones, and what the relative density of the disturbances were. And we, the mappers would be able to simultaneously work and correspond with each other, and the really, really cool thing that came out was it was the first time we could step back at a very broad scale and look at the distribution of these disturbances. And it was actually kind of quite surprising. What we found is that about 130,000 square kilometers of northwestern Canada has terrain impacted by these types of disturbances. And that's indicated by the yellow pattern and the red pattern. So red, red squares have a high density of, of slumping, yellow has a low density, and green is essentially devoid of those types of disturbances. Took a very conservative mapping method, so we probably undermapped. What is actually, what, as a permafrost scientist and a, and a, and a geologist, what 
became even more interesting is when we started to look at the patterns of distribution. I've just highlighted the maximum extent of the Laurentide ice sheet. So that's the ice sheet that covered the entire, most of North America or Canada uh, up to about 10,000 years ago. And we find that the edges of the glacial extent tend to bind the uh, landscapes that are affected by these disturbances. Now, when we put in other positions as the glacier retreated and re-advanced, they tend to um, tie together or connect a lot of the dots on this, on this map. And what we think is, is, is the case here is that when a glacier, when a glacier advances, it creates something at the toe of the snout of the glacier, which we refer to as a moraine. And these are materials that are bulldozed by the, by the snout of the glacier or are incorporated into the shoe of the glacier or into the base of the glacier. And then as that glacier melts out, it creates this kind of undulating landscape. And it, the moraines characterize large parts of southern Canada, Europe, any place that's been glaciated. And, and geologists use those to actually map the, the edges or the extent of, 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 a glaci of, of, of glaciers or where they used to be. Now, in the north, or like 12,000 years ago when the Laurentide ice sheet thawed out, these moraines and, and these, these glaciers uh, would have formed and they would have been very inhospitable environments. There would have been huge amounts of, of change going on. In the north, permafrost degraded and it actually maintained or, or preserved that ice. So in a sense, many of these environments in the north are kind of hung up in time. They've been, they've been preserved uh, in time. And if we think about the landscape change that occurs with deglaciation, we should expect huge changes in, in these landscapes and, and we're starting to see them. So the, again, this is uh, the other photo there is Banks Island, um, the Jesse Moraine, and um, it's basically uh, the landscape there is underlain by almost pure ice. Uh, the other thing we did is we looked at the relative change that I talked about for the Peel Plateau, and we see that the changes we're seeing in the Peel Plateau are actually pretty normal um, for these types of landscapes. Banks Island, uh, from the 1970s to present day, the distribution of disturbance has increased 600%. Uh, the top coastlands, the, the amount of change has actually been much less. So the take-home messages that um, I want to leave you with on with this part of the presentation is that climate change will cause massive alteration of some landscapes. Not all. Um, so understanding the distribution of ice, understanding how the ice was in place is, is really a key to understanding the sensitivity of, of, of landscapes to change. Understanding the changes and the impacts of stressors on the landscape requires a multidisciplinary effort. But a point I think that's important is few have a mandate to collaborate and to integrate. And particularly in government, whether it's the federal system or the territorial system, um, our departments usually have pretty significant and tight problems and issues that they need to deal with. Um, but it seems to me with a lot of these more complicated issues that we're going to be faced with in the future, um, collaboration is going to be, it's really going to be critical. Not even just to understand what, what our relative perspectives are on these, on, these, uh, on these issues. And then finally, policymakers will have to consider uncertainty and anticipate encountering conditions without precedent. That's something that I think we just have to understand is, is going to be a part of our future. So a couple summary slides. And um, the first is uh, permafrost is changing in response to warming. And we've talked about that already. Um, and that's, that's something that we have good empirical data on. Knowledge of the Northwest Territories environment and climate change will help us anticipate change and inform planning and mitigation measures. So we're in a situation of, we're in a, the, the reality is that things are changing. It's not the time to turn the lights off. Um, I mean, this is a time when when I think science can play a very, very important role um, in, in terms of um, you know, helping us make better decisions uh, and manage our, our territory. Some landscapes have a huge amount of potential for change, but not all. And I think the reality is that we have to expect some surprises. But the consequences of a poor knowledge base will be that the surprises will be bigger and they will be more costly. 
Knowledge sharing and multidisciplinary approaches will lead to advances in knowledge and adaptation. And if there's some way that we can foster that, um, be it through venues like this, but even in the way that we work together as, as government scientists and policymakers, uh, I think it's something that, that has to be encouraged. And then finally, resilience. Um, and, and this is more from, a, I guess, a policy and planning perspective. Uh, we have to build in flexibility and develop multiple options to deal with chain, change and uncertainty. I, I think there's a lot of people thinking around these ideas and the notion that you can sort of muscle your way through problems or engineer your way out of, you know, just keep doing what we're doing but we'll do more of it, is people are starting to rethink that idea. And, um, you know, I, I hope that um, some of the stuff I've shown you today would, uh, would cause you to think uh, about that a little more critically as well. So that's all I have for you today, and I'd be happy to try to take some questions from you.